Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward. Today's video is a little different. This is a supercut of all of my content I've released in the last month. So there is no new content, no new information, no new speculation. So why in the world have I put this together? First, I thought this might serve as an interesting time capsule for the pre-release excitement that Starfield has brought to us. Second, Lots of you have joined us on our Starfield journey at different points over the past month, and I thought this would be a cool way for you to see some of the videos you missed and revisit some of your favorites. Third, I'm traveling for work this week, but still wanted to stay active in the Starfield community. Now, I have left out just a couple of videos that were very specific in nature, such as the video uh, debunking one of the leakers about a month ago, but everything that is still applicable and fun speculation, it's all here. So if you want to enjoy the videos again, or even if you just want to support the channel by playing this in the background while you work or falling asleep to this soothing Southern voice, <laughs> that would be a big help to the channel. Thanks for watching, liking, and commenting. Now enjoy this Starfield Signal Supercut. When they said it would have over a thousand planets, they weren't bragging about how big it is, they're bragging about how small it is. Let me explain. Welcome everyone, this is Starfield Signal, the place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we're going to be talking about why everyone is wrong about Starfield's planets. I'm excited for this one, let's get into it. Now ever since Starfield has been rumored, people have speculated on just what space exploration is going to look like, what it looks like to travel across the galaxy to different star systems, and what it would look like to visit different planets. Well, last year, Todd Howard himself revealed the first gameplay footage of Starfield, during which he shared this awesome information. You can land in New Atlantis, but you can also land and explore anywhere on the planet. And it's not just this planet, it's all the planets in the system. From barren but resource-heavy ice balls to Goldilocks planets with life. And not just this system, but over a hundred systems, over 1,000 planets, all open for you to explore. Now this was huge and exciting news, but of course with most things on the internet, everyone started chiming in with their two cents about why this is too big and why this is too many planets. And the prevailing thought at the time was that procedural generation of over a thousand planets, this wasn't actually going to make the game more interesting, but it was going to essentially water down the experience with dull, barren, and useless planets that's just gonna waste the player's time. Uh, I don't necessarily buy this, but unfortunately procedural generation has become somewhat of a, a trigger word in recent years. Uh, Bethesda's own Fallout 76 proved to be an absolute train wreck. Fellow space exploration games like No Man's Sky and Elite Dangerous, they also use procedural generation and they have shown how it can often be used uh, to generate more quantity of content as opposed to quality of content. And this has caused many people to be skeptical when it comes to how procedural generation can actually make a game better. An article came out just back in November of 2022 from PC Gamer, and it claims that there is no way a thousand planets in Starfield are interesting. Author Wes Finland goes on to lament the woes of procedural generation, citing the historic game Spore and its inability to follow through on its grand promise of procedural generation. I get that, but there are a couple of problems here. First, Wes assumes that all procedural generation is made equal and uses a game that is built on technology from the year 2000 to make an argument about a game that is developing its own technology in 2023. Not exactly the same thing. In terms of technology, that's essentially going from the Flintstones to the Jetsons. Second, Wes blindly misses how procedural generation can take on various forms and be applied in countless different ways to make video games truly come alive. The game that put Bethesda on the map, for a lot of people, Skyrim, definitely used these systems to its advantage, and they were able to create one of the greatest games ever. So how exactly can Starfield use procedural generation to create all of these planets and still maintain a quality that builds into the overall experience and the value of the game? In a recent podcast with Lex Friedman, Howard actually gave some insight into how they are pulling this off. How can we have a system to generate these planets 
and make them look, you know, I'll say reasonable. And so we did find a way, we came up with a way, um, had prototyped of, of building tiles, like large tiles of landscape, the way we would usually build them. We kind of generate them offline, hand do some things and end up with these very realistic looking tiles of landscape and then built a system that wraps those around a planet mm -hmm. and blends them all together. And we had pretty successful results with that. So we thought, yeah, we could, we could do this. So Todd explains these planets aren't simply random computer code that decide everything about all of these planets. They actually start with handcrafted quality design elements and developed a sophisticated system to integrate all of these assets together in a really smart way to make these planets. So we can know that every planet will be 100% unique and it will be designed in a way to minimize pattern recognition because of how they've designed these massive land tiles. With this in mind, you might say, okay, I got it, everything's going to look and feel unique, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these planets will actually be interesting. I don't wanna travel halfway across the galaxy and spend all kinds of fuel and resources just to land on a planet and have absolutely nothing to do. Well, Howard again agrees with you. There was a big design kind of problem to solve in terms of well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing because there's a lot of planets and moons, if you kind of, right, in reality that, well, there's nothing on them um, except resources. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience, as long as we tell the player, here's what's there, here are the resources that are there, go find them. But I equate it to that moment of we said about listening to the wind go and watching the sunset. And I do think there's a certain beauty to landing on a strange planet being somewhat the only person there building an outpost. And we are modeling all of the systems because that's how we like to do things. So you can watch whatever that gas giant or moon, it will rotate and go and sunrise, sunset, and all of those things that you would expect. And it's, it's all really happening. And most people probably won't notice or appreciate all of that, but, um, I think it gives them the ability to say, I want to go do that and see that on that place. As long as we tell them, hey, the quest leads over here. Here's where the handcrafted content is that you would expect. And then here's more of the open procedural planet experience. So as far as wasting your time on these planets, it seems that the game is going to make it pretty clear what is handcrafted, curated content that is going to emotionally impact your story. And then what is extra space available for players who want to keep exploring and keep pushing out farther and farther from that main narrative. And it's with these points in mind about how the planets are actually designed and how they are easily identified as far as the content that you can find on them that I think whenever they say a system as sophisticated as this has over a thousand planets, they're not bragging about how big the game is, but relative to the possibilities of procedural generation, they've intentionally limited themselves to define a specific experience for players. We do have many, but once you build that system, I think the numbers become, I mean, honestly, a little bit, we, we wrap it in so we can name them all and, and have a finite set, even though it's a very, very large number, but a, a set that we can, you know, validate and, and know about, even though it's a huge number. But once you, once you're building a system that can build a planet, I mean, a planet is sort of infinite space. We go back to the Daggerfall analogy, right? If you have systems to build that much space, doing a hundred planets or a thousand or 10,000 or a million planets is not, it's just, you just press, you just change the number and press the button, but you can't, you can't name them all. You can't control like when you're getting in really big numbers, Hey, what is, what does the system way out here feel like if you take your ship and jump that far? So even with procedural generation, they are crafting a feeling and experience that you can continue to have as you explore your first system all the way to the last. And even with that, they add a depth of gameplay to each system with a difficulty level. We do level the systems. When you go to system, you'll see, oh, this is like a level 40 system. And us being able to at least control that scale is how we kind of ended up with the hundred-ish systems we have. I think I read that No Man's Sky can generate 18 quintillion planets. 
I'm sure that if Bethesda wanted to, they could design their procedural systems to rival, if not massively overshadow that in theory. However, they seem to be taking a different approach. There seems to be every indication that Starfield will have a great balance between using the kind of procedural generation that helps develop spaces, items, quests, and all kinds of experiences with the kind of handcrafted, emotional, and environmental storytelling that Bethesda games are famous for. That's why everyone is wrong about Starfield's planets. They aren't bragging about how large the game is, they are bragging about how they've taken the wonder and joy of exploring the unending universe and condense that down into a finite experience that they can curate and polish. Hey, if you're into Starfield, click subscribe and the notify bell. We have a video coming up about how Starfield will have one of the most sophisticated economies we've ever seen in gaming. Hit that like button as it is a huge help. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and I hope you enjoyed the video. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Xbox's first Developer Direct event was held on Wednesday, January 26th. Community response to the event was largely positive, noting an all-around fun and excited tone without being too cringy. Some great gameplay footage of all five games featured, as well as much-needed release dates for all games but one. And it's here in these release dates that Xbox might have made a big mistake and accidentally revealed the Starfield release date. My bet is either on 4423 or 7723. Let me explain. Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for all things Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward. And like most of you, I am crazy excited for any news we can decipher about Starfield. So let's get into it. As we mentioned in the intro, Xbox revealed release dates for five new games coming out this year, starting with Hi-Fi Rush, which released the night after the event, Minecraft Legends on April 18th, Redfall on May 2nd, The Elder Scrolls Online Necrom expansion on June 20th, and lastly, and unfortunately less defined, Forza Motorsport coming sometime in 2023. Of course, Starfield, as Xbox promised, was not seen or even mentioned in the showcase, but that doesn't mean we didn't get a hint of a release date for Starfield. For starters, it was largely believed that Starfield would be released after Redfall this was due to a statement made by Microsoft's own Matt Booty. However, since that statement was made, Redfall's expected release date was pushed back till later in the first half of 2023, and as we now know, specifically May 2nd. And Xbox has previously said that Starfield will be released in the first half of 2023, so does this mean that Starfield is releasing between May 2nd and June 30th? Well, maybe. To get a better idea of when Starfield will be released, let's zoom out and look at the bigger picture of all major releases coming to Xbox in the first half of 2023. Overall, a pretty packed Q1 and Q2 of 2023 for Xbox and games in general. So what does this reveal to us about Starfield's release date? Looking at release dates, publishers don't necessarily need their games to have a wide open window where no other games are releasing within a certain number of weeks but they do need to think about similar games that compete for the same gamer's attention, time, and money. So for Starfield, I imagine Xbox wants to stay away from competing with other established action adventure or RPG simulation titles. At the same time, Xbox's transition into leaning heavily into Game Pass means that they want to keep a steady stream of new games and new content coming to this subscription platform to keep members active and subscribed. Hey, speaking of subscribe, I'd love it if you subscribe to this channel and join us on our Starfield journey. Thanks. Now with these things in mind, about competing for attention on release dates and keeping a stream of steady content coming into Game Pass, let's see what makes the most sense for Starfield's release. It would be crazy for a brand new IP, even out of Bethesda, to go up against Zelda. So I think May 7th through May 20th are out. They probably wouldn't release Starfield too close to Redfall either, before or after, so I'm going to eliminate the last week of April and the first week of May. And while Minecraft Legends and Starfield most likely will appeal to different gamers, with the new action-adventure strategy that Minecraft is going for, Xbox will likely steer clear of this release window, as well as a week before launch. 
Going back up into March, Wolong, Jedi Survivor, and Resident Evil 4 make for a pretty full month, though I could definitely see Starfield not being affected too much by Wolong, so we'll say there's a chance in this window between March 5th and March 16th. Of course, Destiny 2 Lightfall at the very end of February has the potential to take some attention away from Starfield in this release window, but there's still a chance. Though Hogwarts Legacy is certainly a contender for Starfield, I feel like releasing in February at this point wouldn't give Xbox the necessary marketing time they will need to launch Starfield successfully. So let's look back up into May. I feel like the last two weeks of May would give time for the Zelda hype to die down a bit and offer a good release window, but this is still within a month of Redfall, so there's a low chance. Lastly, in June, let's assume Diablo 4 does actually release on June 6th. If that happens, Xbox will probably want a solid two weeks after that before they release Starfield, but then you're right up against the Elder Scrolls Online, Necrom. With all this considered, if Starfield is releasing in the first half of 2023, the release window that would make the most sense is either the first week of March or the first week of April, which in this scenario, I would lean towards April. If Xbox released Starfield on April 4th, 2023, this would give them a solid release window where they are not in direct competition with similar games for a couple of weeks. 4.4.23 has that certain marketability to it that Bethesda loves so much, and this would be the start of Microsoft's quarter two and make for some pretty great Xbox numbers as they report to their investors at the end of the quarter. This is also just in time for many gamers in the United States to receive tax refunds, which for better or worse, people usually spend on large purchases like TVs or special edition gaming consoles. There is actually another option. This one is a bit trickier because it technically goes against Microsoft's claims that Starfield will release in the first half of 2023. But there have been rumors and speculation that Starfield might be pushed out of this window. The reason why I think it could happen is if we look at July's expected game releases. As of now, there are no major releases scheduled for July. And while technically falling outside of the first half of 2023, this could be the perfect opportunity for Xbox to release their new summer blockbuster game with no competition and gamers wallets and news cycles devoted solely to Starfield. 7723 also has a certain marketability to it and would set Starfield up for huge success for the summer season here in the States. That's why I think Xbox made a huge mistake and revealed Starfield's release date. My bet is either on 4423 or 7723. Let me know what you think in the comments which date is most likely. Or are there other reasons you think it could be something else entirely? Subscribe to the channel to keep up on all things Starfield and give this video a like if you are excited about Starfield. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we are talking about the upcoming dedicated Starfield event from Xbox and Bethesda. Here are 10 must-have features for Xbox to pull off the ultimate Starfield showcase. I'm particularly interested to see the comments about number three. Let's get into it. Number one, release date. This is what everyone has been clamoring for. With the original release date being announced in June of 2021, Bethesda bolstered the confidence of their fans with the 11-11-22 release date. Keeping fans enticed with a slow trickle of content through videos, artwork, and scripted interviews, Bethesda was slowly building up excitement for Starfield. That all unfortunately came to a crashing halt when they announced in May of 2022 the game would be delayed to the first half of 2023. This was very disappointing to get a delay, but then doubly disappointing to get a cryptic and extremely vague release window. Since then, speculation, leaks, and rumors have spiraled out of control concerning when the official release date will be. As of February 6, 2023, there has been no further clarification on Starfield's release date. For the showcase to be a success, this has to be the primary building block. With no release date, the showcase will be considered a failure regardless of the other content. Number two, spaceflight and ship mechanics. Seeing just a glimpse of spaceflight in the gameplay reveal event last summer, we still know very little about what it will actually feel like to pilot our ship in addition to other mechanics. 
Todd Howard has also mentioned in interviews that in addition to dogfighting, you can also disable, dock, board, and even steal other ships. These are all pretty interesting mechanics in theory, but it would be nice to get a sense of what it actually felt like through a longer gameplay sequence. It was also mentioned in an interview that your crew can help you operate the ship. I would love to see how this process works. Do you simply assign a crew member to always be on guns or comms, or is this a dynamic system and allow for you to move people around in the heat of battle? Number three, space to planet transitions. We have known for quite some time that Starfield will not feature seamless transitions from space to a planet's surface. Todd Howard remarked that these are designed to be two different realities. They wanted to work really hard on making them both look and feel incredible. Taking the time to engineer the seamless transitions between these two realities wasn't the best use of their resources. It's just not that important to the player, Howard says. With this in mind, we still have not seen what alternative solution to this transition Bethesda has landed on. Pardon the pun. This was actually somewhat shocking that Starfield would not include seamless transitions, mostly because other space exploration games tout this as an impressive feature in their mechanics. Several are concerned this means the game will be full of cutscenes every time you want to land or depart from a planet, causing major pacing issues. Hopefully, Bethesda has cleverly come up with an appealing way to transition these two realities without disrupting the tone and pace of the game. Before moving on to number four, just wanted to say a quick thanks for watching the video. If you're enjoying yourself and you're excited for Starfield, I would love for you to subscribe and join us on the journey. Number four, planet-based travel. There has been much speculation about vehicle-based travel once your character is on the planet's surface. With planets seemingly having infinite space, as Howard says in an interview, it would make sense to have surface-based vehicles to make travel much more practical. But some believe that planets are too big for vehicles to really even matter, and it would make more sense to simply launch into space with your ship and then re-land at your desired destination. Sure, I can see this argument, but again, it seems to be very disruptive to the tone of exploration and the pace of a good gameplay loop. Hopefully, there is a good explanation of how we can expect to enjoy exploring all 1,000 planets. Number five, more combat. Fans of Bethesda games know their worlds are packed with endless things to do and places to go, but one of the threads that ties everything together is always the combat. Whether you play as a stealth-based character and avoid combat at all costs, or you play as Space Rambo and can't wait for the next explosion, Good feeling combat is absolutely key to making everything work, from the visual, audio, and haptic feedback our controllers give us, to the combat's intensity and pacing throughout the encounter. This will be a huge part of many players' decision to buy the game. We need to see several minutes of uncut gameplay with different combat encounters to get a feel for how it all ties into the overall gameplay loop. Number 6. More Stealth As previously mentioned, many players love taking the stealth approach, if you're like me, one of my favorite characters to build in Skyrim was the Stealth Archer. I even made a build that could summon a magic bow and arrow so I didn't have to worry about inventory. If you're with me, leave a like on the video and let me know what your favorite Skyrim stealth build was in the comments. As we've seen in previous gameplay footage, we do know that several stealth mechanics are back, such as sneaking, pickpocketing, and lockpicking. But to get a good idea of what these really look like in action, Bethesda needs to give a couple of minutes of uncut gameplay dedicated to stealth. Number seven, companions. Anyone familiar with Bethesda games knows their companion system can offer some great benefits. Need a little extra help with a difficult dungeon? Want some interesting dialogue as you travel on your journey? Or do you just need a pack mule to carry all of your cheese wheels? Yeah. Companions can offer some great variety to the gameplay. We know the robot Vasco is one of your companions you encounter early in the game, but we didn't really see him function as a companion. Will they all be able to join you in combat? Maybe some have certain skills or talents that make them better suited for some encounters over others. If companions are going to bring more life and dynamics to the game, we definitely need to see more of them. Number eight, cities and outposts. Bethesda has gone on record saying, New Atlantis, the city where Constellation is headquartered, is the largest city in the game and the largest city they've ever designed. We don't have too much information about the other cities other than general descriptions and their vibes and cultures. 
A walkthrough of each of the city's most vibrant districts would be an incredible way to see all the subtle nuances and differences between each of their cultures. Whether it's turning in quests, stocking up at a store for your next mission, or checking in on one of your companions, revealing more of the world of Starfield will help fuel the imagination of the fans. Number 9. Crafting One of the features that really makes players feel connected to Bethesda games is its crafting system. Whenever you are questing and traveling around their worlds, using weapons and tools that you've made or designed yourself really adds to the immersion and ownership you feel about your game experience. With the seemingly heavy emphasis on mining and resource gathering, we could hope this is also going to serve to open up the crafting system in Starfield. Not only will there be more raw materials to craft with, but hopefully there will be endless variations of weapons, suit mods, and tools that you can craft to really make your experience unique. Getting a more in-depth look at the crafting system would be a great addition to the showcase. Finally, number 10, 15 to 20 minutes of seamless gameplay. Sure, it will be heavily scripted, but this will allow us to see all of the different systems and mechanics working together to form a coherent and rewarding gameplay loop. The original gameplay reveal only had about 30 seconds of uncut gameplay at the very beginning, and that was a pretty casual walk out of the spaceship and a few seconds of scanning. I want to see what the pace is like. What's the vision? Show us how to have fun in this universe. Can Xbox pull this off? Will Bethesda have enough of the game ready to showcase? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. It's been incredible to see our channel grow. We are all super excited for Starfield. If you want to join us on the journey, we would be happy to have you. Click those subscribe and like buttons and we will see you soon. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Starfield is the next massive galactic RPG simulation game from Bethesda Game Studios. While we still don't know a lot about Starfield at this point, I have reason to believe Starfield might actually have one of the best economy systems we have ever seen in gaming. Let me explain. Welcome everyone, this is Starfield Signal, the place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we are talking about why Starfield might have one of the best economy systems we've ever seen in gaming. A quick thank you to my first 2,000 subscribers. We are a week into this channel, and there are already amazing people here with just some amazing insights. We invite you to subscribe and join us on the journey. So let's get into it. During the gameplay reveal trailer released in June of 2022, Todd Howard was revealing Starfield's outpost system and said this. These act as a home away from home for survival and resource generation. You can choose where and how to build each one, and you can hire characters you meet to keep it up and running. And you can hire characters you meet to keep it up and running. You can hire people. I missed this during my first watch, but it really stuck out to me the second time I was taking it all in. This, in conjunction with several other elements we see in the game, point to the potential of a very deep economy system in Starfield. I want to take a quick detour to set this up and then we'll come back to the specifics here. If you don't want to chase this rabbit with me, I'll go ahead and put a timestamp uh, down below at the bottom of the screen for when we get back into the Starfield specific content. RPGs and simulation games are no strangers to great economy systems. There are basic systems that simply balance the amount of in-game currency you receive from questing and exploration to the cost of weapons and armors that you can purchase. And there are more sophisticated systems that are dynamic and can actually react to your character's choices and actions. In Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, you're able to collect rupees throughout the game, their in-game currency. Sometimes rupees come from exploring the game map, cutting through shrubs, or even digging up rocks. Larger rewards come when you find a hidden chest in a dungeon or collect your reward from defeating a powerful foe. You can then use these rupees to purchase weapons, armors, and other items to help you along in your adventure. This is a great example of a simple economy system, and I want to be sure to note that simple does not indicate a lack of importance or thought put into the system there is still an immense amount of balance needed in these systems. By simple, I just mean that there are no other factors influencing the economy. It is closed and set, 
You either have the amount of rupees you need to buy a shield or you don't. Contrast this with a game that goes a little deeper, Knights of the Old Republic. Kotar, as it's endearingly referred to by fans, sends you on another grand adventure complete with one of the best main storyline quests in gaming history. But it also has smaller side quests and storylines that add tremendous depth to the game. Within all of these quests and explorations are rewards that contribute to the economy system in-game, again allowing you resources to buy or trade for items. Pretty similar, but one way KOTOR adds depth and texture to this system is through their RPG mechanics. Along your journey, you not only level up in power, but they also give you the option to shape your hero's personality and skills through the choices of your attributes, skills, and features. This video could quickly devolve into a rant about how amazing this game is, so I'll try to get to my point quickly. Through the choices you make in the character progression system, this opens up new dialogue options for you to either persuade or scare, intimidate people into giving you more money. This means your resources are no longer simply confined to what you can find in boxes or loot off of your enemies. But because of choices you've made, you now have potential to influence the game's economy. My last example and my favorite is Fable 2. I absolutely adored this game when it came out in 2008. In fact, if you were a fan of Fable 2 when it came out, hit that like button so I know I'm not alone. This is actually the game that made me realize how interesting economy systems in video games can actually add to their depth, replayability, and overall fun factor. I'll go ahead and admit I'm sure there are other games out there that do this way better or built on the ideas that Fable 2 had, but this was my first love in this regard and it'll carry the idea just fine. If you give me a few minutes to gush about Fable 2, I promise it'll make a lot more sense when I start to align these ideas with Starfield's economy system. So what was so great about Fable's economy? This was the first game I played that didn't just have an economy system for you, the player, it had an economy system for the world. This extra layer of depth and sophistication created a whole new level of immersion to the player experience. Sure, it had the basic level, get money from quests or enemies and go buy a new sword. It also had the character influence part, I'm an evil character so I'm going to scare you into giving me more money. But there were namely three more pieces of the puzzle that made this game really click for me. Property ownership, item arbitrage, and dynamic town economies. Pretty much any property that you could sleep in, work in, or shop in, you could buy. Of course, these properties would be very expensive relative to your gold in the beginning of the game, but eventually as you played through the world, you could save enough money to buy a small pie shop or a wagon that you could rent out as lodging in a camp. Through setting rent and prices, you could control not only how much money these new properties earned you over a given period of time, but these decisions also affected the overall economies of their given locations. Eventually, you could build your real estate empire to include larger stores or even the town taverns to dramatically increase your regular salary. One of the ways you could dramatically accelerate your gold acquisition was through item arbitrage. Since the game economy system featured surplus discounts and shortage price hikes, this allowed you to buy an item in one town for a 50% discount and then sell it to a traveling merchant at his inflated price of 25% over base price, giving you essentially a 75% profit margin. And you can see if you started out doing this, even with small items like basic swords or boots or a bow and arrow, you could eventually build your margins to do this with the most expensive equipment available, creating massive margins of profit. Lastly, your decisions dramatically affected the individual town's economies. If I were to go into a market with tons of gold and buy everything the shops were selling, that would actually improve the local economy. By giving the shops more sales, they were actually able to invest in higher quality items, which they could then sell at higher margin, leading to more profits, which led to better economies overall in that town. You'll even notice this in the town properties. If you made decisions to improve a town's economy, they will have nice furniture and stocks of fresh quality food. But if you make decisions to lower the town's economy, such as crime, theft, or violent acts, you'll notice the properties will decrease in value and have old, broken furniture and poor quality food stocks. All of these systems work together to make you feel like you really were making choices that mattered, not only for your hero's journey, but for the people living in the world that you were trying to save. 
I think the same ideas could be present in Starfield. Maybe not exactly the same, but I feel like there will be several parts of the economy system working together to really highlight the weight of your choices. Okay, let's get into the details. Let's go back to the clip that really inspired this theory. Todd says here that you can hire people you meet. To hire someone, you have to pay them. You actually have to pay them regularly. If this is the case and you'll actually have ongoing salaries to pay NPCs working in your base, it would make sense to have an income generating system to offset this ongoing expense system. In this same section, he says, These act as a home away from home for survival and resource generation. Unless you can pay someone in iridium or iron, this makes me think there will be options to not only set up modules in your outposts that generate resources, but also modules that export these resources and generate income. A few clips that support this theory can be found from the 12 minute mark to 1205, where we see ships transporting cargo and fuel containers, heading to what looks like a large depot station to connect trade routes. Just this alone is enough to get me excited because I'm a big nerd like that, but if we keep looking, the economy system keeps getting deeper and deeper. Going back to an early part of the reveal video, we catch a glimpse of a few hints into the economy system in the character creation segment. Here at 8.59, we see the background Cyber Runner. Its description mentions megacorps and alludes to a working relationship you can have with these corporations. This background specifically seems to give you an edge in making extra credits from these encounters. Continuing to 901, we see the diplomat background comes with a bargaining starter skill. The description says it allows you to buy for less and sell for more. This calls back to the arbitrage part of the economy system we mentioned in Fable 2. I could imagine this being useful at the start of the game. Maybe you don't have quite enough capital to set up your first outpost or start passively generating resources, but you can buy resources in one system at a low price and sell them in another system for a profit. Furthermore, once you're able to generate these resources at scale, I imagine you would actually be able to affect the market value of those resources in individual systems. At 910, we see the trait Kid Stuff, and its description reads, your parents are alive and well and you can visit them at their home, but 10% of all your money you earn is deducted automatically and sent to them. First of all, what kind of deadbeat parents are we gonna have in this game? Secondly, again, I think this points to a steady stream of income as opposed to just static rewards for individual quests. It would seem a bit odd every time you collect a reward from an NPC to immediately send 10% to your parents. Going back to the idea of capital, we do see that Starfield will have a banking system complete with the ability to take out loans. At 915, we see the starter home trait, which reads, you own a small house on a peaceful little moon but it comes with a 50,000 credit mortgage with Gal Bank, probably short for Galactic Bank. This seems to indicate a regular interval of expenses that you'll need to offset with regular income. And while not stated explicitly, I would imagine if you get mortgages for homes, you can also get loans for outpost development or shipbuilding. Todd has mentioned in interviews that ships are designed to be expensive. They wanted to add some weight to the decisions you make to have your own ship and to upgrade it to meet your needs. Around the 1030 mark, he goes into the shipbuilding segment of the video. Here we see the individual parts of your ship can cost around 14,000 credits, and I would imagine these aren't even the best parts that you could get in the game. Altogether, these starter ships can cost around 175,000 credits. So buying your first ship will certainly be no small feat. Also in this section, we see there are several checks and restrictions for upgrading your ship, one of which is the crew you will need to add on certain modules or upgrades. Will these crew members just kind of work with you on Constellation's behalf and you don't have to worry about their salaries? Or will these be staff like in your outpost that you'll have to hire and pay them regularly? This section also hints at another part of the economy system in Starfield, competition. Here we see there are several different manufacturers of ship parts, all competing for your hard earned credits. Great economies need healthy competition. We even see a variety of different manufacturer labels on the weapons and suits featured throughout the video. It's within these dynamics we could start to see the economy system go even deeper. 
As we talked about arbitrage and exporting resources earlier, I imagine these manufacturers will also be in need of resources. Could it be possible to partner up with a manufacturer to gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace? Would they offer certain discounts or incentives prioritizing their needs over other manufacturers? We already know there are traits in the game that allow for discounts with certain groups. The traits Raised Enlightened and Raised Universal both offer discounts at their respective stores if you subscribe to their group and ideology. It's possible a manufacturer might offer similar discounts if you cross a certain threshold of resources delivered. And while we don't see the description, the backgrounds Industrialist and Long Hauler can be seen in the character creation segment around the nine minute mark. My guess is these backgrounds provide certain perks associated with exporting and manufacturing. Lastly, could it be possible to develop your outpost research, crafting, and exporting systems to the point where you no longer need to serve these manufacturers, but you could potentially make your own manufacturing company and sell directly to customers, keeping all the profits for your empire and making unlimited money, except of course the 10% which goes to mom and dad. Even with all these theories, I still have many questions. What happens when your income cannot meet your expenses? Does your ship get repoed? Do you get evicted from your house? Does Gal Bank send debt collectors or bounty hunters after you? Parenthetically, bounty hunter is a background option, so it's quite possible. There's so many interesting possibilities that could add depth and texture to the economy system. These are the reasons I think Starfield will have one of the best economies we've seen in gaming. Let me know what you think in the comments below. What do you think will be the quickest way to make credits? Bounty hunting, manufacturing, or are you just going to live the pirate's life and steal and sell spaceships to the highest bidder? My guess is, it's all possible. I would love it if you subscribed and joined us for the journey. If you're going to totally ghost your parents and keep that 10% for yourself, hit that like button so I know I'm not alone. Thanks for watching and spending some of your time with me, but for now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Starfield is the next major release in a long line of space adventure and exploration games from the past decade. Bethesda Game Studios has touted they are uniquely equipped with the right people, system, and tools to make the best space game ever. With this comes high expectations of not only story, design, and overall immersion, but of course ship-based combat in space. In an interview with IGN, Todd Howard made these remarks concerning space combat. So there is some dog fighting. I have quotes up. Um, <laughs> we keep the pace fairly slow. This, along with other remarks, has caused concern that space combat in Starfield will not feel epic. But I'd like to argue that it could still be fun. Let me explain. Welcome to Starfield Signal, the place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we are talking about space combat. If you've ever played or watched gameplay from other space adventure games, the space combat can be one of the most fun and dynamic elements. Managing your power between the weapons, shields, and other ship systems, all while maneuvering your way through combat can really make for a fast-paced and exhilarating experience. From the gameplay footage Bethesda showed off at its reveal event, I would argue that the space combat looked fairly fast-paced, especially when fighting multiple ships at once. That's why when I heard Todd Howard's remarks about wanting to keep the space combat slow-paced, I was genuinely disappointed. Bethesda has said again and again how they like to say yes as much as they can to the player, so that the freedom they have adds to the immersion of their experience. Here, it seems that Howard and the team have said no to fast-paced space combat and have really limited the player experience. I imagine for some players, this is where they will be excited to spend most of their time in the game. Roaming open space throughout the galaxy, role-playing as a pirate or smuggler, itching to get to the next dogfight. If the game intentionally keeps these combat situations slow-paced, this could lead to these scenarios becoming boring and repetitive much quicker. If you're enjoying this video so far, I'd love for you to subscribe and join us on our Starfield journey. Thanks, now back to space combat. 
couldn't they at least allow for an option for the player to choose the pace and challenge they wanted for space combat? I'll be the first to admit I am not the greatest at flight combat in any game. If there is an easy or slow mode, that is honestly the one for me. The early Star Wars Rogue Squadron games were just the right pace for me. They allowed for an engaging player experience, all while keeping the controls for flight and weapons simple. Elite Dangerous, on the other hand, leans far more heavily into the simulation side of things. Here in Elite, just as Todd mentions, you have the capabilities to control your allocation of power between several different systems, have preset weapon and tool combinations ready to cycle through, all while giving you complete freedom and flexibility to engage in combat at your own level and your own pace. Although I will say I quickly get in over my head when it comes to dogfighting. With this said, I do second guess whether Todd means space combat will always be slow paced or just that you will be able to make the decisions of whether or not to engage in those slow or fast paced encounters. We already have heard him talk about how they reworked the fuel system for space travel. He mentions in an interview that they had a fuel system that would actually allow you to get stuck out in space and you had to call for help and wait it out. The idea was that they wanted a sense of realism and wanted to give the player the freedom to make those risky decisions to keep moving forward even if they weren't prepared. However, after testing this and giving it some more thought, they realized this heavily penalized the player and essentially brought the game and fun to a halt. And that is never good. So if this line of thinking is a part of their process, I would think they would also apply it to space combat and not keep the pace so slow that it becomes boring and repetitive and eventually sucks the fun out of the game. I know this is very wishful thinking, but let's keep digging in. He mentions they have played and were influenced by other space games, but he mentions they were specifically influenced by Mech Warrior for the pace of the combat. Those of you who have played Mech Warrior, let us know in the comments if you see this being a good or a bad thing. I looked up just a few gameplay clips and I can definitely see how this would feel slower pace than other games. As I watched, I did feel, however, like it wasn't the speed of the pace that was the purpose of the design choices, but the nature of the pace. What I mean is, there is always something on the screen to engage with. There is always a turret or an aircraft or an enemy vehicle, but they never seemed like they were overwhelming the player to where they had a button smash or panic to get out of a situation. If anything, it felt more methodical, more calculated, like you could go in with a plan and strategy and execute that for a successful run on an enemy base or camp. And this actually seems fun to me. Just like Devil May Cry fans could say that Dark Souls is slow paced, Dark Souls players would say, no, it's calculated and methodical. One of Todd's last statements about the space combat actually aligns with this theory. Like that, that's probably a little bit slower, but in terms of systems and power and being able to line things up. Now it's a little bit faster than that, but you know what I mean, as opposed yeah. to a twitchy dogfighter. It would have been nice if Ryan followed up and asked for an example of a fast-paced twitchy dogfighter game, but I'm picturing something like Ace Combat. Hopefully we'll get some more information, clarification, and most importantly, more gameplay to see for ourselves what we can expect. I know several of you are already extremely skeptical of Starfield. Is this another nail in the proverbial coffin for you? For those of you who are excited about Starfield and ready to buy the game yesterday, does this give you any reason for pause or concern? Let me know in the comments. I'd love for you to subscribe. And if you like this video, you can click on the screen here in just a few seconds and it'll suggest another one of our videos for you. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Welcome everyone, this is Starfield Signal, the place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we're breaking down the most unique system in Starfield, shipbuilding. Starfield is an RPG simulation built with several complex systems coming together to form a holistic and unforgettable experience. While Bethesda are no strangers to character creation and base building, it's the shipbuilding that is a brand new feature in this game and will be one of the most unique systems we've seen out of Bethesda yet. We're going to dive into the building section first as it's the main focus for this video, but after that, we'll go back and point out how many different spaceships we actually see in the reveal video. And I'll be honest, there were a lot more than I initially realized. 
Hey, if you are not subscribed, we would love for you to consider joining us on the journey. It has been an incredible ride so far, and it's only going to get better the closer we get to release. Thanks. Okay, let's dive in. When we first board the ship, we see what looks to be like a common area, maybe a section of the ship that's used for meetings, plannings, equipment storage, and this might even be where your companions congregate when they're not on task with something. Here we see a quick shot of the pilot's cockpit. And a quick note, I believe we've only seen one seat cockpit so far, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was an option to have two seats to have a proper co-pilot. Next, we see a research hub, and it's implied this is on your ship. Originally, I thought you could only have these in your outposts, so it's really cool that you can have one with you all the time. It might even be neat if the research facility on your ship is limited in some way as a mobile option, but then the research facilities in your outposts are more comprehensive and can tackle bigger projects. Also, this does seem to be one of the most realistic games I've ever seen, because look at this poor researcher's face. She definitely looks like she's at work. Next, we have another section of the ship that looks like a comms or ops center. I tried to zoom in on the 8K video file, but I still wasn't able to make anything out that was discernible on the monitors or whiteboard. Oh, except for this. Next, we finally get into our building system. Here, we have a nice grid layout with what I think looks like a fairly clean and minimal interface. We have info on the top right and left corners of the screen, then a stats display at the bottom. In our top right corner, this will be the place for information on credits, how much our vendor and our character has, and as we'll see later, the cost of each part, as well as the total cost for all changes. On the top left, we have indicators for our ship levels, Looks like there's three different W indicators, possibly for weapon types. Then we have what I think is ENG for engines, then SHD for shields, and lastly, GRV for our grav drive, the device that allows us to warp in space. There's also number indicators for a reactor level as well as total equip power. I'm unsure of what these mean exactly without any context. Finally, down on the bottom of the screen, this looks like several different stat levels that will be affected by the changes we make to our ship. As they start the customization process, they zoom into the cockpit first. We can see that this particular cockpit is named the Magellan C2 cockpit and is made by Nova Galactic. It has a cargo capacity of 60, health of 9, and two crew slots. I assume this means it adds two total slots to your crew capacity and not that it requires two crew to run. This cockpit costs 10,000 credits and has a mass of 10. We might assume that is 10 tons. And at the very bottom here, we see this specific cockpit actually requires the skill Starship Design. As they move on, they choose to replace an engine. They grab a Relodyne White Dwarf 1000 engine. As you can see from the changes on our HUD, the engine costs 14,000 credits, has a mass of 100, it gives several other pieces of info and then how it affects our existing ship build. This one lowers our engine power by three, increases our grav drive by one, then down at the bottom, we also see we lose hull integrity from 317 to 252, and we lose cargo capacity from 460 down to 450. Mobility also takes a hit from 70 down to 49, but we'll see here in just a second, they add a second one and it boosts the mobility back up to 98, brings the hull integrity back up to 352, and finally adds another 100 tons. We also see the same process happening with other modules. We see a Titan 350 Helium-3 tank added to the side here that really boosts the engines and the grav drive stats. Then we see the highlighter go over the NG-15 lander port four. This is just landing gear. The port means which side of the ship and the four indicates it's towards the front of your ship. You can see in the stats window, it only has health stat. This could just be a basic lander, but maybe more advanced landers could have other stats that potentially boost your shields or maybe come with a small cannon to improve weapons. But the main thing you want out of a good lander is the ability to land. As we keep going, we see a couple of other sections without much info. Then we get to the first weapon, the Horizon Defense Mauler 104L Cannon. Man, what a great name. Here we can see that weapons have different classes of quality and require reactor power to function. 
In just a few more frames, we see the Dragon 221P MW Pulse Laser, also from Horizon Defense. Next, we get our first look at a reactor. This is what will be generating power for your ship. You can see on the left stats window, this is a class B. It generates 16 power, even has a repair rate, which is an interesting stat. And I bet that may somehow tie into crew mechanics as well. And of course, as the power center of the ship, it's going to cost quite a bit. This ion beam H1010 reactor from Zhang is 78,000 credits. We can also see more options over in the right window with their respective cost and power levels. Then we switch back to a list of landers. I looked to see if there was any difference in the descriptions here, but they all just say they help land on the roughest of terrain. So I don't think these will limit which planets you can actually land on, although that would be a cool mechanic if your landing gear did have to pass some sort of check to land on certain planets. The last few seconds of the shipbuilding segment feature cosmetic design. We see the cockpit and other parts of the ship changing through colors. And it does look like they offer hue, saturation, and brightness levels, so you're not limited to presets only. So you can really customize each of your looks. Finally, you might have noticed as we were looking at some of the other footage, there is an indicator in the bottom right corner that changes from nominal, warning, and then error. It looks like error only applies when you don't have a part attached that is necessary for flight, such as fuel tanks. Nominal is a bluish green with a check beside it, which would seem to indicate that the ship is clear to fly. As best I can tell, it looks like the warnings are there to point out when you don't have a certain weapon type equipped, or if you significantly reduce one of your stats, but I'm not sure yet. Hey, if you found this video interesting or it's helped get you excited for Starfield, leave a like on the video and let me know in the comments if you're going to steal or buy your first spaceship. Thanks. Now let's go through the video and identify how many different ships we can spot. At the very beginning of the gameplay, we see our initial ship here at the start of the video. Here a little bit later, we see the Crimson Fleet ship at the research center. It's called the Crimson Fleet Ghost. Later on, we see the same Crimson Fleet ship uh, coming to help out, and it actually makes me wonder if this is the same ship we saw earlier. Is there an RPG mechanic at play here where we could potentially sabotage that ship before we enter the research facility? That might be cool. A little bit later, we see our ship again. Here, I think this is our ship again. Here we got another Crimson Fleet, same as before, I'm pretty sure, and then another Crimson Fleet ship, but this is an actual different ship. You see, it doesn't have the big uh, engines on the side like the others did. Again, we see Crimson Fleet, same as the first. Here we have some enemy ships, and these look like Crimson Fleet as well, because they have those big engines on the side. So far, we've only seen our ship and then Crimson Fleet ships, but now we're starting to get a little bit more variety. Here we have a different ship. You notice the engines look a little different on the side. We get our first look at a cargo ship here. This one is a big fuel transport. Here we have another new ship. Again, notice the different thrusters or engines, uh, possibly from a new manufacturer because they look a little different. Here we have our ship again. Here we get another look at a new ship. Again, notice the different engines on the side. We have our ship here and then uh, what looks to be like a new ship because it looks to be uh, like it has a little longer of a uh, of a body to it again at 12:15, we see here we have a new ship again at 12:17, features a new ship 12:18, looks like we have two new ships 12:20, we have a new ship and then 12:21, we also have a new ship all of these are new and finally at the end of the video at the 14 minute 15 second mark I'm pretty sure this is our same ship that we started the video with, but it is giving us a fantastic outro to the gameplay reveal video. So in this gameplay reveal video alone, I count 15 unique spaceship builds. I think this is going to add a lot of longevity to the game. With all of the different RPG mechanics playing out to make each of your characters and stories unique, having a wide variety of spaceship builds is only going to enhance the unique feel of each of your playthroughs. 
If you've had fun with us today geeking out over the shipbuilding mechanics in Starfield, I would love if you subscribe to the channel, leave the video a like, and tell us in the comments what you're going to name your first ship. I just might have to go with the Ebon Hawk. Thanks so much for watching, and may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and today we're breaking down the outpost building system. Along with the shipbuilding system, I think this is another thing a lot of people are really excited for in Starfield. I had a lot of fun putting this together, and I definitely noticed some details I had missed before. If you are new to the channel, thanks so much for watching. Now, without further ado, let's get into the outpost building breakdown. Okay, so we're going to start right here in our survey view. Just a few things to note. The banner at the bottom of the screen uh, has your outpost that you're able to put out. It has the number 30 beside it now. We are unsure up to this point if this is, a, is an outpost limitation for the specific location you're at, or if this is a limitation for the system, or if this is a limitation uh, for how many outposts you can put out as a whole in the entire game. Um, any of those, it's possible that this could this number could be upgraded and extended through the RPG mechanics, through upgrading your character or upgrading your stats. Uh, so it's uh, we still have a lot of questions, but interesting to see nonetheless. Uh, we'll see here we're on Vectera. Uh, it's this is a moon, so we're gonna play through here and we'll see. And once we have our beacon placed, we see some information pop up at the bottom. We have uh, cargo, crew, power, and production stats uh, none of those are live right now because we don't have anything built and then and notice down in the bottom left of your screen it has Vectera Outpost 1 Vectera Narian so it could be that Narian is the planet that this moon is associated with it might also be that Narian is the system uh, we're not sure so lots of questions still I'm gonna play through here see what we get uh, notice also the big yellow ring around where you've placed the outpost beacon so the outpost beacon, I think, kind of gives you an area of where you can build. And so this looks to be a pretty large area. Uh, I It's hard to judge right now. Here in just a, a second, we'll get a, a better idea. But I have a feeling this is going to be at least like maybe a quarter of a mile radius, uh, maybe up to a half a mile. We we will see. But I think it's going to be plenty big to, uh, to get some good starter outpost built. All right, playing through there, uh, we see kind of finally pop up into the a building section of this. I want to draw your attention down to kind of the bottom of the screen. See the little orange um, object there? That is actually our outpost beacon that we just set up. And then I'm going to try to zoom in here using my 8K footage. Uh, but you'll also notice a little bit down and to the left of that is actually our character. So that gives us a little bit better of an idea of, of the scale that we're working at with as far as the area that we can build in and then also the size of the outpost. Okay, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is up in the top left-hand corner, uh, we have uh, the name of the structure that we're choosing. We'll get to those here in just a moment. But then we have our building requirements, uh, namely aluminum and iron here. Then it gives us the units of measurements uh, we need. Also gives us an idea of the operating cost. So, um, so pretty soon we're going to have to start worrying about power. We already see down in the bottom right part of the screen. Uh, where we were looking earlier, the cargo crew, power, and production. Our power has jumped up to 30, so I'm unsure if that means that so far we need 30 um, units of power for this structure we've built so far, or if we're generating 30 units of power. Uh, again, we will hopefully find out in the uh, showcase coming up. So going ahead and moving your attention to the right part of the screen where we see uh, the structures listed, and notice that it has the, the left bumper and right bumper indicators up there as well. So that lets, uh, that lets us know that we can cycle through uh, different categories of, of building units. So these are structures. There are probably a lot of other things, cool things, so we can check out too, but we don't get to see that in this specific part of the video. Again, looking down our list of structures, we have our airlock, which is pretty much our, our entrance to the, uh, to the structure, to the outpost. Then we have a four-wall habitat, um, doesn't give us any kind of indication as to what that is. Might just be a generic basic room for getting our coffee, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe doing some planning or just walking around in, just kind of filling out the, uh, the outpost as a whole. Here we get into the next one down, the hydroponic habitat A. 
and hydroponics. Uh, I wasn't familiar with this, but I looked it up on Wikipedia, and this is a type of horticulture and a subset of hydroculture, which involves growing plants, usually crops or medicinal plants, without soil by using water-based mineral nutrient solutions in aqueous solvents. So that sounds really cool. Also a great way to make sure you can grow food on barren planets that you, you can't grow crops in. So of course that would make sense if uh, this is going to be you know more grounded game kind of in science and, and technology. Then if you have a crew you know, uh, operating this outpost, they're gonna have to eat, right? You're gonna have to sustain them, not only with the finances, which we've talked about that in the economy video, if you haven't checked that out, uh, I'd love for you to go watch that. I'll put a, I'll put a card up in the, the top part of the screen here, but um, we're also gonna have to sustain them with food. So that kind of makes sense and that's cool they're thinking about that. So of our hydroponic habitat, we also see uh, the science habitat, and this is a small version. And then below that, we have our military habitat. So these are what I'm going to safely assume is where we, uh, where we do our research and then our crafting, respectively. So that's cool that we're going to have, you know, this isn't just like a bench, you know, like a workbench like a lot of RPGs have. But this is an entire room, an entire building dedicated to crafting or dedicated to research. And as we've seen in some of the trailers so far, it really looks like you're building out uh, these areas that it, it's going to look really neat. So I'm excited for that. And then if we keep going down, we also see uh, there is another hydroponic habitat structure, the round structure. Then we have a small hex habitat, and then a uh, hallway, and then a watchtower. So a lot of those things, again, are probably just structures to kind of build out your outpost, design it the way you want, make sure you have enough um, crew space for, for the crew you need to operate this outpost. And then the watchtower, I find that interesting. I've heard other people talk about that these watchtowers could be for managing the uh, the traffic coming in and out of your outpost area for uh, for trading, for trade routes. So if you set up a trade route with different research or different resources you've gathered, uh, that could be cool. It also might be for protection, like if there are uh, aggressive and dangerous fauna in the area to, uh, to man those off to protect your crew. And here we have a good look at what looks to be some sort of radar or satellite system. And it's produced by Axion, so that's cool. Again, here in this part, we get another look at that big circle, our, our building radius that we have access to. And it also looks like we have here three wind power generating objects. Uh, I'm unsure of what they're actually gonna be called in the game, but uh, they're generating 24 power total. So we might assume that they're generating eight uh, units of power each. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I would also assume we're probably gonna get a look sometime at maybe solar energy options or potentially even building up uh, hydropower if uh, we have a, a lush planet where there's flowing water or rivers around. That would be really neat. Let's keep watching here. We get a good look at the outpost as a whole here in this shot, which honestly, it just looks really, really cool. You can notice in the structure itself, look at the round structure there, that first round structure. It has a glass ceiling. And so you can see in there, which is really, you know, that's just a great design choice, I think. Here we see in our uh, research structure, this, this worker is uh, working on something there. Some people have mentioned maybe she's working on textile material. I am not sure, but I bet we will find out soon. Here we get our first glimpse of a little robot buddy. We've already seen Vasco, our helpful robot out in the field that will be one of our companions with Constellation, but this looks to be like an outpost uh, specific robot helper. So that is really cool. So what do you think about this? Does this look as sophisticated as you hope it's going to be? Uh, does it seem a little simple for your taste? Um, do you feel like this is going to give us the opportunity to really build out uh, some of those RPG mechanics they keep talking about and really make this universe our own and tell our own stories? Uh, I hope so, I think, I think it will. Hey, if you're still watching at this point of the video, just wanted to say a quick thank you. Uh, also, I would love your feedback. I've uh, taken a bit of a different approach with this video and used a bit more of a conversational tone and just kind of, uh, I didn't have a script for it. I just kind of played through the video and then re recorded the voiceover uh, over it. So uh, let me know if you like this style or if you prefer the more kind of uh, chiseled, polished, more kind of, uh, hey, hey here, here are some some helpful thoughts instead of just uh, kind of saying what is on the screen. But uh, I actually enjoyed going through this video and look, taking a deeper look at the uh, outpost system. I hope you did as well. 
Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. I ask that you subscribe if you're excited about Starfield and maybe like the video that helps me out a ton. And uh, that is all we have for today, but keep a lookout for other videos coming very soon. Specifically, I have one in the works uh, going into a deep dive about the faction system and the different factions of Starfield. I'm very excited about that, but it's taking a little more time than I anticipated uh, just because there's not much on it. And so I want to be sure to give you guys a good video. But for now, thank you for watching and may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. I've seen several videos covering the Starfield factions. This is going to be a different approach than what you've probably already seen. And I'll explain that here in just a minute. Like many Bethesda games, Starfield will be chocked full of history and lore with all kinds of ways to connect with its world and systems. Being an open world sandbox, Starfield will offer a backdrop of culture and interesting groups to engage your curiosity and promote exploration. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive on the faction system in Starfield. Here are nine secrets about Starfield factions you need to know. And I would definitely stick around for number one as it could affect your first playthrough. Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get started. Secret number nine, the major factions. There are five major factions that we know about so far through all of the gameplay videos and interviews Bethesda has published to this point. These consist of the United Colonies, the Free Star Collective, Ryujin Industries, the Pirates of the Crimson Fleet, and of course, our favorite explorers, Constellation. Now, there are other groups that might technically be considered factions, but they've only been mentioned briefly or not at all, which makes me think they are designed more to fill out the RPG systems in the game as opposed to contributing to any kind of storyline. These consist of the Ecliptic Mercenaries, Violent Spacers, the Religious Zealots of House of Varun, House of the Enlightened, and the Sanctum Universum. I wanted to say parenthetically, this video is most likely a part one. As of now, we just don't have a ton of info on each of these factions. As marketing for Starfield ramps up and we start getting more information, I'll revisit the topic with updates and more specifics about the individual factions. You'll notice moving forward, this list is more focused on the gameplay elements of the faction system. And that's what I referred to earlier when I said it would be different. Secret number eight, faction headquarters. Some factions are connected to specific locations. The United Colonies and Constellation are headquartered in New Atlantis, and the Free Star Collective has their capital in Aquila City. Neon is home to the Megacorp Ryujin Industries, and I would imagine would have some interesting side quests related to one of the religious groups since Neon is identified as a pleasure city. And through a neat little Easter egg, we get a hint that the Pirates of the Crimson Fleet once stuck to the outer parts of the settled systems mainly causing problems for the Freestar Rangers, but now they're actually becoming more aggressive and operating within the United Colonies systems. I thought this was a pretty cool Easter egg they put in their videos for us to uncover. Keep up the good work, Emil. Secret number seven, faction stories. The part of the gameplay reveal video that features most of the factions is referred to as the stories in Starfield. While we still don't know much about these stories, we do know that most, if not all, of the proper main and side story content is tied to the factions and the characters you meet in them. Now, of course, there will still be other minor stories told through random quests that we get along our journey, but the big and memorable story beats in the game will most likely be told through the factions. For a game as big as Starfield, I actually really like this concept. This ensures that if you're really interested in the big stories that Starfield has to offer, you know exactly where to find them. You don't have to worry about missing a major plot point found in the back of a cave on some volcano-laden planet at the edge of the settled systems. Secret number six, faction exclusivity. Will Shen, the lead quest designer of Starfield, shared some interesting thoughts in one of the Constellation Question interviews when asked if the player would be locked out of some factions after joining others. Here is how Will responded. We also discussed really early on, like, okay, do we do we make some of the factions in conflict with each other? And we decided, you know, we really want to make sure that you can play through all the faction lines uh, independently of each other. So it seems that none of the factions are exclusive. You will be able to join all of them in a single playthrough if you wish. I love that they've thought about this from the player's perspective. Sure. Most players who are interested in the factions will most likely have multiple characters and multiple playthroughs, 
but it's nice you don't have to wait another 30 hours of a complete playthrough just to see what a new faction is like. Secret number five, connecting storylines. Now that we know we'll be able to join any and all of the factions, and considering the factions are what will drive the main story content of the game, it's interesting to wonder if any of these stories will overlap or join together in unique ways. In one of the promotional videos, Made for Wanderers, the lead designer said this. It's a cool thing about Crimson Fleet, you know, what if you're a good person and you want to be a good player and you don't want to play as a bad guy, you can side with the pirates or you can report back your superiors and be like basically space cop type of thing. So let you be a good person and still play with the bad guys. I think that's really cool too. I think this is really neat. Knowing how their players love freedom, Bethesda has allowed some space here for a nuanced playthrough where you can still work through the Crimson Fleet's morally compromised storyline, but still play as a good character. This makes me wonder what other kinds of situations we might encounter where two factions' values are at odds. Maybe this is foreshadowing for Secrets 3 and 2 on our list. Secret number four, faction roles. Unlike the factions or guilds in past games, you won't necessarily be working through the faction quest to ultimately be promoted to lead each faction. Rather, you'll be given an opportunity to influence the direction and values of the faction. Will Shen, again, offers an example of this. And this time around, we were like, no, we really want the stories to be a little more personal, right? You're influencing the direction of where this faction is going to go. So say the politics of the Free Star Rangers, right? You know, what's more important? Is it justice or industry, right? Where are you going to try to nudge them in this direction or another? So you don't necessarily end up as the head of every single faction of the game. I actually really like this change. Sure, it's cool to move up the ranks and eventually become the leader of a group. I mean, who wouldn't want the perks of being the leader of the Thieves Guild, right? But after you've completed all of those quests and you're leading the group, there's no one else left to actually give you quests or keep the group interesting. So I'm hoping this is an answer to that problem and they'll use their procedural quest system in conjunction with the factions to have an endless amount of quest for you. Sure, they won't have big story beats, but it's better than nothing and will hopefully be a good way to score some big credits to build that fleet of spaceships you've been dreaming about. If you are excited about Starfield and enjoying the video so far, I would love for you to subscribe and join us on our Starfield journey. If you're tired of clickbait or negativity towards the game, this is a great place for you. Secret number three, Faction Companions. We're not entirely sure how many companions you'll have in the game or what their full capabilities will be, but we do know that some of the factions will offer companion characters for the player. Specifically, we know that Constellation will have multiple companions available. Here's another segment from Will Shen's interview. The companions along the uh, Constellation storyline, which is the main quest, they'll have a lot of opinions, and uh, points of view about what the decisions you'll be making along the main storyline. We've also added in several times where you can ask them to speak for you. So cool. you might have a companion with you and, and you'll be challenged to someone will tell you you can't get through here and you can actually you know, turn to your companion and say, hey, actually, could you handle this? And they'll actually speak on your behalf and there could be consequences, uh, good or bad, for what they happen to say. So it seems that not only will you have companions from some of the factions, but depending on which companions you choose to bring with you on quest, that could alter the outcome of some of your missions. I think this is a great game design choice. It adds another layer of freedom and with all of the different combinations of companions to choose from, this adds a ton of replayability even within the main quest line. Secret number two, faction consequences. As we've seen in other Bethesda games, we could assume that in gameplay, it's possible for your companions to get injured or even die. But the writers alluded that some of your decisions may also have repercussions for who makes it to the end of your journey with you. So they'll have opinions about whether they're good or bad, you know, and for a few of the storylines, and including the main quest, who ends up with you at the end, right? You know, there are some, you'll be determining the fates sometimes whether someone lives or dies or whether someone's still in the, in the faction or decides to leave the faction. This leads me to believe there will be major story decisions that get you kicked out of certain factions if you don't support their agendas along the way. This definitely adds some weight to your decisions throughout the game. 
With the amount of dialogue reported to be in the game, I imagine our companions are going to be much more fleshed out as characters. It's possible we might really connect with a certain character from a faction, but ultimately make decisions that alienate them from us. One piece of evidence for this is what Todd Howard said about a deeper relationship system in an interview with Lex Friedman. We wanted one where, okay, we can be in a relationship and yeah. um, we've committed to each other in some way, but I just did something that really made you angry. And as opposed to just drifting out of that status, you're in a temporary, I don't like what you did state. Before we get to secret number one, if you are enjoying this video, click or tap that like button for us. That'll tell YouTube to keep you up to date with more Starfield news, and it'll help us connect with more people who are excited for the game. Thanks so much. Finally, secret number one, faction rewards. While you have the freedom to join or not join any of the factions, there are some decisions made in your character creation process that may prove useful in certain factions. In the character creator, we see in the gameplay reveal video, we come to the traits of your character. Here we see different options, but the traits that will affect your major faction playthroughs are Freestar Collective Settler, Neon Street Rat, and United Colonies Native. The only description we get to see is that of Neon Street Rat. For the perks, you get extra rewards for the missions you complete on Neon. This will be especially helpful for the Ryujin Industries faction questline, and while I'm sure your faction quest will take you off-world, it's nice to know you'll be gaining extra rewards for the majority of those faction quests. However, like Todd Howard mentioned, there are disadvantages to each of these traits. For this one, we see that your crime bounty with other factions will be greatly increased. And this is kind of a bonus secret, because this lets us know that within the factions, there is a bounty system. So I imagine that if you commit crimes against the United Colonies, this will not only put a bounty on your player, but it might even affect your status with that specific faction. Keep in mind though, that the developers didn't want to restrict your access to any of the factions or their quest lines. So even if you do get a bounty, there must be ways to pay that off or remove that status so that you can continue in that faction's quest line. These were our nine secrets you need to know about Starfield Factions. Which ones did you already know? Again, we hope to follow up with a part two about factions as more info becomes available, so be sure to subscribe and enable notifications so you won't miss it. Thanks so much for watching and sharing our excitement for Starfield. We look forward to seeing you in the next video. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. I haven't seen any other Starfield creators covering this, and though it's kind of hiding in plain sight, I feel like with the value this brings to Starfield's tone and atmosphere, it deserves a dedicated video. If I'm honest, my journey with Starfield didn't start with the first announcement. Like many of you, I was more concerned about the next Elder Scrolls game and when it was coming out than some random space game Bethesda was adding to their catalog. It wasn't until I saw a specific piece of media that the idea of Starfield captured my imagination. It wasn't the teaser trailer or the gameplay reveal video, it was actually this artwork. There was something about it that pulled me in, something that made me wonder, something almost Spielberg about it, hearkening back to E.T., Indiana Jones, or dare I say, Star Wars. So in this video, I want to celebrate and take a look at the artwork of Starfield. Welcome to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke Woodward, and I'm so excited to review some of the amazing artwork we've seen so far out of Starfield. This isn't going to be an in-depth analysis where we pixel peep or try to make a bunch of lore or story speculation out of the artwork, but more of a chilled museum tour to explore some of the tones and environments that Starfield has to offer. Like most art, I imagine we'll all have our favorites, so put the timestamp of your favorite artwork in the comments below so that we know what your favorite is. With that in mind, let's get started. We're going to start with one of the location featurettes Bethesda released last year, starting with the most notable, New Atlantis. Starfield's game designer said this city is actually the capital city of the United Colonies, 
one of the factions in the game. Which, by the way, we'll have a video all about Starfield factions coming out soon, so be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that. Back to New Atlantis. It's interesting to see the differences in imagery comparing this artwork to the footage we saw in the gameplay reveal video. In my opinion, we didn't really get a good look at New Atlantis in the gameplay reveal, and it honestly seemed a bit small and empty. But this artwork definitely gives me more of a thralling city kind of vibe, and it even makes me think of what some of our current major cities in the world might evolve into in another 300 years. Places like New York City, Tokyo, and Sao Paulo. Before moving on to the next city concept art, here is some other beautiful pieces of art. These feature more interior shots and concepts of daily life. Before moving on, if you are enjoying this video, be sure to click or tap that like button as it really helps out. Now we come to Aquila City. This in contrast with New Atlantis is the capital of the Freestar Collective, another faction in the game. This artwork specifically is really evoking some Tatooine vibes for me. I'm almost waiting to see the Millennium Falcon come flying over the mountains. Boasting their own culture, the people of Aquila City value individual freedom which is probably why it has more of a small town vibe as opposed to a bustling city full of corporations and manufacturers. Looking at the gameplay footage, Aquila City seems to be a bit more consistent with its concept art. Of course, Starfield is going to feature some amazing landscapes and hopefully a photo mode. Here are some beautiful renderings of exterior shots of our ship and other planet locations. I'll probably come back to some of these in a lore video in the future. Lastly, Neon. This is a very intriguing city, and it gives off more of a Las Vegas nightlife kind of feel. The story goes that Xenofresh Corp discovered one of their fishing outposts harvested a type of fish that actually produced a psychotropic drug, and of course they followed the money and started producing Aurora. With people coming from all over to get access to this new drug, the once calm fishing platform quickly developed into the city of Neon hosting all sorts of commercial efforts to capitalize on the tourism Aurora brought to the city. If you are into Starfield, I invite you to subscribe to the channel and join us on the journey. You can also tap that card at the top of the video to see what we're looking forward to in the upcoming dedicated Starfield showcase. Thanks so much for watching. For now, may you find wonder as you journey through the stars. What makes a game fail? Is it sometimes death by a thousand cuts? Tiny, seemingly insignificant things that developers either don't notice or define as tolerable? Could it also be massive missteps in management? Gross negligence to an existing fan base? Or overzealous marketing departments? Unconcerned with the long-term effects of misleading hype or outright false advertising? This video is for the gamers that have been burned. 
the gamers who want to hope again, who want to feel the excitement and anticipation of an upcoming game, but guard their emotions so they won't be disappointed. Starfield is coming. Fans are excited, but there is a subgroup of gamers who feel hurt, lied to, and betrayed due to their experience with Bethesda Game Studios. These gamers hate Starfield because of Fallout 76. My goal is not to discount their hurt or even make excuses for Bethesda, but I do want to advocate there is reason for hope. They don't have to miss out on the joy and excitement of anticipating a new game along with their fellow gamers. Is Bethesda unredeemable? Let's talk about it. If you are between 25 and 45 years old, you probably grew up with video games. I have a ton of great memories from my childhood, and I bet you do too. Thinking about games back then overwhelms me with nostalgia. Going to the local video rental store, running to the sidewall with my brothers to look for the newest games, and then playing them all night long with the volume level on three so our parents wouldn't hear. Back then, you chose your games based on a Nintendo Power article and your gut reaction to the box art. Gaming has indeed changed a lot since the good old days, for better and for worse. I don't want to seem just like an old man yelling at the clouds here. There are obvious improvements in technology and leaps forward in creative storytelling. But are these improvements worth the cost? Unfortunately, there is a dark side of the games industry that has grown exponentially since the mid-2000s. This can mostly be summarized by pointing to corporations and how they have fiercely and unabashedly traded passion for profit, all while neglecting the trust of their gamers and brushing their love for games under the rug as collateral damage as they increase profits. However, you could make an argument that due to the greed of these corporations, they have improved the viability of the gaming industry as a whole. With more financial stability and growth, we get faster implementation of new technology, more creatives coming into the field bringing their passion and talents with them. The graphical improvements we've seen in gaming, even in the past decade, are mind-blowing. The mechanics and feel of games has grown more and more sophisticated, the level of narrative storytelling in games has long surpassed Hollywood movies. Would these advances in the industry be possible without the influx of capital these publishers and corporations have engineered? Starfield was officially announced to the world back in 2018 during Bethesda's E3 press conference. This was largely a footnote at the time, as most Bethesda fans were excited about the soon-to-be-released Fallout 76 and then eagerly anticipating the next mainline entry into the Elder Scrolls series, which was also teased directly after Starfield. Excitement didn't really start building for Starfield until June of 2021, when they dropped the official teaser trailer with the game's original release date. After this, they put out a steady stream of content over the next year to entice fans and build up hype, but nothing with too much detail or explanation about the game. It wasn't until the end of the Xbox Bethesda Showcase in 2022 when we got our first good look at Starfield. This is what most of us have been excited about for months now. Just as fans started praising the game's ambitions and dreams, others warned of impending disappointment and broken promises. These were the victims of the troublesome Fallout 76 launch. So what happened between 2018 and 2022 that caused so much cynicism and vitriol in a once thriving and committed fan base? In short, Fallout 76 was a complete misfire. While I don't want to expound upon every single fault of 76's launch, I do want to acknowledge a few of the main issues that contributed to the intense backlash Bethesda received from fans. Number one, overall bugginess and performance of the game. Bethesda is certainly known for having a plethora of bugs in their games upon release. The nature of their vast worlds and deep systems unfortunately lend itself to a certain level of bugginess until the games can be played at scale with millions of players and bugs can be reported. 
In Bethesda games in the past, this is merely presented as visual bugs, characters occasionally getting stuck in their pathing or objects falling through the game world, and the rare glitch that actually breaks a quest or item. I would argue that very rarely would we see legitimate game-breaking bugs that weren't addressed quickly by the development team. Contrast this with Fallout 76's launch. There were exponentially more bugs that caused for really rough and choppy player experience, and not just the occasional humorous bug. The game was riddled with glitches that made playing the game a chore, and server issues made some areas of the game outright unplayable. The game was more of a mess than even Bethesda's most loyal fans could take. And this quickly led to a swarm of refund requests, which did not go well at all. We'll come back to that later. Number two, the game was a literal wasteland, empty and boring. The original design concept of the game must have sounded great in the first boardroom meeting at Bethesda, a game where players get to decide the story and build the world it's an RPG fan's dream. But eventually they wrapped that meeting and never came back to the realization that most gamers need structure and direction, at least to start with. The story was told solely through taped recordings you found along the, air quotes, story path, and never lived up to the storytelling Fallout fans expected. In addition to having virtually no NPCs to give the game character, shape, and tone, Fallout 76 leaned too heavily on the barren environment to shape players' experience, and, unfortunately, it did just that, provided an empty and desolate place for players' interest to die. Number three, marketing and public relations. This was honestly the nail in the coffin for a lot of players. In a strange way, I can understand how everything else could have happened. A game studio trying something completely new and just missing the mark that is within the realm of understanding. But how Bethesda initially responded to and treated their players was surprisingly trashy. I just want to mention two things here. The first, I mentioned earlier, refunds. Once players experienced the completely unacceptable and more importantly, unplayable state of the game at launch, many wanted a refund. Many of these players asking for a refund had only just launched the game and discovered after a few hours of trying to play, the game was broken. Bethesda's policy at the time was no refunds would be issued once the game was downloaded. This of course made fans furious, but then reports started coming out that players who got in direct touch with a support team member were issued refunds. This was a win for these specific players for sure, but only added more confusion to the situation as a whole, as Bethesda's policy had not changed, and most players were still refused refunds. The situation became so bad and so public that a law firm out of Washington, D.C. started investigating the situation for a potential class action lawsuit for unfair trade practices. The second thing I want to mention in regard to marketing and public relations is Baggate. If you're not familiar with this, I recommend checking out Yongye's coverage of the issue. But to quickly sum up the issue of this horrible display of public relations and customer service, Fallout 76 had a Power Armor special edition of the game available for purchase. This edition of the game cost $200 and was supposed to include the game as well as special edition in-game items, plus a map, figurines, wearable helmet, and a canvas duffel bag. And this is where it goes bad. Players started reporting they did not receive the advertised and promised canvas bag in their special edition bundle, but instead received a very cheap nylon bag. Okay, that's bad enough and obviously false marketing. When players reached out for an explanation, they received responses from support like, the canvas bags were too expensive to make, and we're not going to do anything about it. Huh. After this downpour of gasoline on an open fire, Bethesda finally took to Twitter to reassure everyone they understood their frustration, but not to worry, because they were giving all of these players something far better than a canvas bag. They were getting 500 atoms, the Fallout 76 microtransaction currency. Oof, yeah. This story actually has a few more twists and turns, but suffice it to say, Bethesda did eventually deliver the promised canvas bags to special edition owners, 
However, at this point, the damage was done to the reputation, and here we are, almost five years later, still trying to heal from this blatant show of disrespect to their community. With these things in mind, let's ask the question a second time. Is Bethesda unredeemable? Many players certainly think so, but as I mentioned earlier, I think there are reasons to hope in a better future for Bethesda, and specifically for Starfield. Now, many of you might say I'm being naive, and that may be true, but let me offer some of my reasoning on why I'm betting on the launch of Starfield being a success and the start of Bethesda's road to redemption. Number one, focused development. In light of Microsoft's acquisition of Bethesda back in 2021, Starfield is now an exclusive of the Xbox ecosystem. While this does of course include development of PC and cloud, Xbox's development philosophy is designed to make these transitions as easy as possible. And while true, Starfield's development did technically start in 2015, much of the weight of developing for multiple platforms is found in the optimization stages, which they would not have entered until 2021 at the very earliest. Starfield will be using an updated version of Bethesda's creation engine, which was already designed for Xbox development. This ability to focus on developing for one console has most likely led to more streamlined optimization, a focused approach to QA testing, and overall stability of the game. Number two, the A-Team. Fallout 76's development was spearheaded by a different development team, Bethesda Austin, with a different game director, Jeff Gardiner, who is no longer with the company. Bethesda Austin was formerly known as Battlecry Studios as a subsidiary of ZeniMax Media. In 2015, they were pulled off of the Battlecry game and focused their efforts on modifying and restructuring the creation engine to work for the massive online world of Fallout 76. Earlier in 2018, before the launch of 76, they were rebranded as Bethesda Game Studios Austin. Other ZeniMax developers did assist in the development of 76 as well. These included id Software, Arcane Studios, and ZeniMax Online Studios. With the original Bethesda Maryland studio leading the charge in Starfield's development, we can expect the ongoing standards to be much higher and the QA to be much tighter. Furthermore, Todd Howard himself is leading the development as game director. Todd has mentioned before, he has been dreaming about making Starfield for a long time and finally started working on it in 2013 when the name Starfield was trademarked. As a personal passion project of Howard's, he and Bethesda's most experienced and talented developers are sure to put everything they have into the game's development and not settle for the bare minimum just to get the project launched. Number three, playing to their strengths. While this is a new frontier as far as the galactic scope of the game, creating single-player, story-driven sandboxes are one of Bethesda's core strengths. Fallout 76 was a brand new design concept with a whole host of unique problems the team had little expertise for handling. Even though Starfield will consist of multiple planets stretching all across the galaxy, all of these are contained within a similar game design the Bethesda team is very familiar with. Eliminating all of the problems that an MMO brings into development has surely helped the development process in speed, stability, and depth. Number four, acknowledgement of mistakes. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the video game industry is certainly no stranger to the insensitivity and greed of publishers and corporations. It seems that any time a misstep is made on a major release, gamers are met with a tone-deaf tweet filled with insincere PR-scripted drivel. As we just noted, Bethesda themselves were guilty of this in responding to the very legitimate player concerns with Fallout 76. So what makes me think this time will be any different with Starfield? To be honest, this one is a bit complicated. I think the development team learned some really good lessons and will err on the side of caution and will push to delay at the expense of sales if necessary. I think the marketing and PR teams have learned some good lessons about how to simply be more clever and less obvious. One of these is good. I'll let you guess which one. Let's start with the good. After the launch of Fallout 76, Howard got blasted. Interview. Got a lot of criticism, obviously, that 
looking back, we deserve. After interview. Had a lot of difficulties at launch. After interview. You don't want to read that, but it is what it is. And again, um, we deserved a lot of that. And he took it on the chin and apologized to gamers. He definitely approached it from a developer's perspective, but he wasn't callous to the plight and frustration players had experienced. He owned that his team had let people down, and he genuinely wanted to improve the game to win them back, not just to save face. Contrast this with another well-known critical and commercial flop, Anthem. Anthem was the next big IP from BioWare and EA. BioWare, known for crafting story-rich RPGs with compelling characters and fantastical worlds, was tasked with developing an always-online shared world multiplayer action game. Makes perfect sense. Without getting into the weeds, Anthem bounced off of the reviewers and players hard. The story was disconnected and all but absent from the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. There were no interesting characters with internal motivations, and there was no depth to the gameplay. In short, Anthem had no soul no identity. It was even rumored that the different development departments who worked on the game really didn't have a good idea of what they were making and what the big picture was. Anthem was released in February of 2019. By May of that year, it was evident players were not sticking. By February of 2020, Bioware announced they were looking to substantially reinvent the core game. In May, it was revealed that only a team of 30 were working on this rework causing much doubt of BioWare's and EA's sincerity on the project. And of course, a year later, in February 2021, it was announced development would stop on Anthem. This game that was in development since 2012 from a beloved developer barely had a two-year lifespan. This past October marked 76's fourth year since release. And believe it or not, it still has a thriving community of dedicated players Bethesda could have just as easily made up some BS about changing markets and ongoing technology expenses and shut the project down, but they didn't. They stuck it out, went through the difficult process of owning up to their mistakes, listening to the community, and then designing a new vision of the game around what the players wanted. They shouldn't have made the mistakes in the first place, sure, but I absolutely respect them for their commitment to the players and to the Fallout brand. Okay, the other thing. Marketing and PR. I really think these are the teams that screwed players over the most. There weren't any technology challenges here. There weren't any deadlines that mandated a loss in quality. Their decisions were made from poor leadership and a total lack of respect for players. And I'd also like to add a lack of respect for the development team. Pete Hines, the vice president of global marketing and communications for Bethesda Softworks, leads and improves all of the marketing and PR for Bethesda games. He and his team seem to live in a different world than the rest of us and often intentionally isolate themselves from the troubles of development. Regarding how the development team was trying to turn Fallout 76 around and recreate it into a great experience for players, Heinz said in an interview, ultimately it's down to the team. Communication is great, but if the game isn't improving, then it really doesn't mean anything. I guess Pete thinks how they treat loyal Bethesda fans who trusted them enough to spend $200 on their game doesn't mean anything. It's all the developer's responsibility, really. Glad to know you're here for the community, Pete. And yes, that is sarcasm you hear in my voice. So, do I trust Todd Howard and the development team? Yes, not unequivocally, but yes. I think Todd's been intentionally more restrained in his public excitement about the game largely due to the responsibility he knows he has to fans to deliver on that excitement. Do I trust Pete Hines in the marketing and PR teams? No. I know this video is all about hope, but I'm also a realist, and there's no reason to accrue more risk than you need to. I'll go ahead and say right now, for the record, I strongly recommend not to purchase pre-orders. Do not pre-order Starfield especially if they come out with some kind of special edition bundle with a wristwatch or a telescope or some kind of gimmick. And finally, rounding the last point on why I think Starfield's launch will be a success, number five, Bethesda's new relationship with Xbox. Even before the acquisition in 2021, Xbox and Bethesda have enjoyed a very healthy working relationship, all the way back to the release of Oblivion on the Xbox 360. Actually, after the launch of Fallout 76, as all the problems started to rise to the surface, Phil Spencer was one of the first calls Todd Howard made. 
Todd was asking for advice on how to turn the game around and Phil was able to get him in touch with the right people and teams to start the long road of recovery. But now, Xbox owns Bethesda, and just as importantly, Xbox owns Bethesda's IP, The Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield. Xbox paid $7.5 billion for all of these names to be in its house. And Xbox has a large vested interest in their long-term success. This means with a big loss so fresh in the minds of fans, Xbox has every reason to grant Bethesda as much runway as they need to make sure Starfield is a grand slam. Not only for the sales that Starfield will generate over its long life, but for the continued value of their investment in Bethesda and their other brands. Xbox's entire strategy right now is focused on infrastructure and winning the future of the games industry. They know the world is watching with Starfield. Xbox needs this to be a win just as much as Bethesda, and they have as much money and as much time as it takes to get it right. So with the major failures of Fallout 76 in mind, coupled with these reasons why I think Starfield will succeed, let's come back to our original question. Is Bethesda unredeemable? I don't think so. Like all of us, they've made mistakes, missed the mark. We could all play back moments in our head right now when we said something we shouldn't have or when we did something that we still need to apologize for. And yes, Bethesda is a game studio, but it's still made up of people just like you and me. People who are trying to make awesome games, tell great stories, and find ways to inspire hope in a new generation. We all have those memories of our childhood with games. What if Starfield can create some of those memories for young gamers? What if Starfield could rekindle that fire, rediscover that hope that was lost in us? What if in another 25 to 30 years, we look back at today and think, those, those were the good old days. Thanks for watching, and may you find wonder as you journey through the stars.